Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the TF Tuesday podcast. My name is Syl, and I hope y'all have been having a good week. It's been an interesting one for me, and I'm really excited to chat a little more about TF because uh, real world's been getting me down a little bit and I'm definitely in need for some brevity. So uh, I'm really excited to be coming to you today to chat not only about TF but also about its intersection with Therians. And before we just get to that, I will just mention that if you like our content, please check out our Patreon where you can help keep the show going. Um, it's patreon.com slash tftuesdaypod if you want to check it out. And if you have any questions that you'd like to be featured on the episodes, you can tweet at us with the hashtag TFTuesdayPod or comment below on YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, please leave us a like, subscribe, all those good things, ding the bell, whatever. All right, that's out of the way. So I'm really excited to have Aaron on today with me to chat not only about TF, but also about uh, being a Therian and how the two intersect. So Aaron, I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself and give folks a little background on uh, yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Aaron. I am a Timberwolf Kitsune Therian. I've been furry for about nine and a half years-ish. Um, I do a lot of stuff. I enjoy fursuiting, I enjoy traveling, I enjoy getting art, and I enjoy going on hikes and all that stuff. Basically, I enjoy being fluffy. <laughs> and it is great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I agree. I mean, it's always best to be fluffy or scaly or some other version of a, a creature. So uh, yes. we're in agreement there. <laughs> yes, yes. But the greatest way to do it is a little TF. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I'm really excited to kind of chat a little bit about the intersection of TF with uh, Therianism. And We've definitely gotten a lot of requests in the past as to having an episode on this topic. So I kind of wanted to start on the ground level a little bit and start really with the basics. So for those who might not be aware, what exactly is a Therian? A Therian is someone that believes they should have been born as a different species than the one they were born as. So they, instead of it being like a character or some sort of alternative to themselves, like this is my idolized... This is their core identity. This is who they visualize themselves as being day in and day out. So instead of like people going, oh, I'm just a human day in, day out. And that is true. Some people are like that. For people who are Therian, it's like, no, I am a wolf. Like, literally, I'm a wolf. And I can't really change that. I didn't have a choice. It just kind of happens where you are what you are. So I'm curious then, because I've heard it sometimes characterized as almost being a, a spiritual sort of connection, like you said, like almost being born in like the wrong species body. Mm -hmm. Would you say that like categorizing it as kind of a spiritual co connection is a fair characterization or would you think that that's not quite capturing what you're going for? No. So it is, I don't see it as spiritual at all. Now, to be fair, I see why. Because there are some Therians that do see it as it is a spiritual aspect where, okay, so maybe I am this because past life or because maybe I'm just a spirit and, and being put into this body to explore the world and this. I'm here because of some sort of spiritual reason. I see it as something in my brain when you are this shape, not the shape of your body. Your form is wrong and that's just the way you were born. It is not really something you decided. It's just you discovered that, oh, this is how I'm supposed to be uh, wired up. So, but I do see it as, I do see why people would say it's spiritual, but the answer is it isn't spiritual. But some people, they use spiritualism as a way to explain why they are Therian. Okay, got it. Yeah, because I've sometimes heard it being characterized as like, oh, like, my soul is in the wrong body. Or like, um, you know, there was like some sort of mix up when I was being born or what mm -hmm. have you and stuff like that. And that mm -hmm. always has seemed like almost spiritual in some nature to me. But um, it, I understand what you're saying, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I see that for sure. Where if you don't, if you need to find a way to explain it, the easiest way to say is, oh, I was just born in the wrong species, or I oh, past life, I was this, and this is why I'm here. You don't have to be spiritual to be Therian. Therian is not 
a choice. It is, oh, I am this. Okay, it's like, I didn't choose to be gay. I just discovered I am gay. And now I use that information. I do what I can with that. Either just hide back in the closet and do absolutely nothing about it or go, okay, I'm going to embrace this and just live my life to the fullest. No, that makes sense. And uh, I think that's a really interesting analogy. So then I guess my next question would be, you know, when did you come to the realization you were a Therian and how did you finally like key into that realization? I was a kid. So when I was young, I knew something was wrong. And by young, I mean by six or seven, I was already having TF dreams of turning into different animals. I actually had those dreams before I even knew what the word transformation was, which is, I guess that should have been a sign. Uh, I remember <laughs> finding different books about wolves and wolves, uh, people turning into wolves, or people turning different animals. Uh, then, of course, I found animorphs at one point, but this is our at this point, I've been thinking about this for years before I even found that yeah. lovely series. And then it took all the way to, I was 11 in July of 1998 when I was watching a cartoon and had anthro dogs in it. And suddenly light bulb goes off my head of, I need to turn into a wolf. How do I do it? And I started designing, I started designing, I started designing. I was 11 years old when I figured out, I need to be wolf. I don't want to be wolf. I am wolf. I need to be wolf. I need to I need to become wolf. How do I do that? And it wasn't until I was a teenager that I found out there are others like me. And that was freshman, sophomore year of high school. I found out there was a group of people and there was a term for it called Therian Therapy. So it took me about four-ish years before I even found out there's others like me out there and there's a term for it. And I was like, I'm not alone anymore. Holy crap. So my egg broke a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. And I guess, uh, was that like independent of your uh, gender exploration too? Like, were they yeah. all tied to one another? So I had gender transformations as well by the time I was in fourth grade in 1997. I remember I was on a field trip, and I saw my classmates in a skirt, and something went, I want to wear a skirt. And then there was just two separate things. One was a TF Dreams of turning into a girl, and the other TF Dreams would be turning into wolves, fox, anything, but usually wolves, because I thought it was a male wolf. It took all the way till college at age 19 in 2006. What if... The wolf was female, and then suddenly that egg cracked. And I went, oh, I'm Therian and transgender. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, and that took me about 10-ish years to come out of that closet, although I came out of the Therian closet in 2007, right before my 20th birthday. Wow, that's early. Yeah, so before my 20th, so I came out, of the trans, of uh, the Ethereum closet at age nineteen in two thousand seven, and the, in the gender closet in two thousand sixteen, when I was twenty eight. So definitely two very different experiences of having the egg hatch, but both leading to the same conclusions. I would say that being transgender and Ethereum are very very similar. It's just that there's just two components. Just change out one component, swap them. You wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Would you say that the uh, if you if you do if you have dysphoria on either end, would you say they're like similar effects on yourself? Obviously, it's different uh, directions, but do they have like similar effects to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, I took my gender dysphoria and solved it. <laughs> I transitioned. <laughs> Species uh, issues. Uh, <laughs> um well no that don't work um yeah. but yeah 
Yeah, that one's a little little harder to uh, grapple with, unfortunately. Well, I mean, if you have some TF serum high and behind the uh, desk over there. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I might be hoarding it back here. I, oh, so I give that's it on, how you uh, get all order. those Lombax TFs. They're just photographs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I got to do my manip somehow. I guess then I'm curious, like, how would you say that being a Therian affects your day-to-day -day life? A lot. It is every waking moment of every waking day and has been since the 90s, since I was a kid. Every single day it affects me. It is my identity. It is me. And there's nothing I can do to really show the world who I am. And it took me all the way to 2013 to get into the furry fandom and then use that as a way to go and express myself. So... Would you say that kind of going into the furry fandom was in a way one sort of like quasi solution to start addressing yes, some of the dysphoria it, you were it feeling? It was, absolutely. I got into the furry fandom because I was at a friend's house in St. Louis in 2013 and they had a friend who happened to be a furry with fursuits. I remember we visited their house, we watched some movies and whatnot, and then by the end of the night, they showed us the fursuit. And they showed us the closet with the fursuit bodies yeah. and the paws and the heads. And they just gra one grabbed a head and just put it on me, and I looked in the mirror, and for the first time in my life, I saw a wolf staring back. And I just went, okay, where do I get one? And less than two years after that day, I had a full suit. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yeah, within well, two years of that, of me becoming a furry, I had a full suit. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my gosh, yeah, that must have been really nice. I dive-bombed into this fandom. Yeah, I, I so desperately want a suit. I'm going to get one eventually, but um, I can only imagine that feeling that you felt once you finally got it. That's that's awesome. <laughs> I I mean I make I make do with my tails um but you know uh that only goes uh so far so uh, True. anyways you need a proper <laughs> lombax tail and have a little poof at the end Yeah oh no I I mean I I love my tails I I have a, a number of them uh but oh my anyways, I, the lombax one is my favorite for obvious reasons I I have tails in this house let me tell you I have 28 <laughs> fursuit tails in this house I don't have a problem okay I might have a problem <laughs> It's it's all hey it's it's all part of getting through life you know like we we cope in different ways um, so <laughs> so then you know I'm really curious if there's any sort of common misconceptions that you feel we should dispel because I think that you know obviously we started at ground level with kind of defining what Ethereum is and I think there's obviously some people who don't even know what that means but there's also I definitely think like some misconceptions about um, like what Ethereum is and how that like you know affects people so I guess I'm wondering if there's any that we should like take the time to like go through and dispel. All right the first one is that not all Therians are furries and not all furries are Therians. Sure, you can have a furry and be a Therian, and a Therian be a furry, but does not mean they equal the same thing. There is huge overlap, but the Venn diagram is not a circle. Because I know plenty of Therians that are not furries at all. Yeah, I actually know a few. I used to be one myself. Like, for the longest time, I was a Therian. I was like, I, why would I be a furry? And then I one day I was like, oh, I now understand. Oh, why did I not think of trying this? I'm curious. Um, what do you think like the the kind of block is for people who are Ethereans but aren't furry? Like, why do you think they kind of separate the two if it can, you know, to some degree show an external presentation? Good question. I know many years ago there was this rift between furries and Ethereans mm -hmm. because Therians just saw these people as just role players mm -hmm. and didn't actually, were just doing this for the lulls and for the fun. Right. And they didn't understand why people would just enjoy doing this mm -hmm. if they didn't believe they were an animal. Like, why would you do something so crazy like right. that? And for some of them, it's like, well, putting on off, it's not going to be me. There's nothing I could do to actually represent the me that's inside. Mm -hmm. I do know... Like, that was my experience of why I didn't jump into 
furry immediately it's because they it just seemed like it was just another way to role play and another way to put something on but you weren't actually doing this because you were this and that was a concept that took me a long time to figure mm-hmm. out of oh people actually do enjoy this just because it's so much fun and you create so many social circles and you get to see things that you never see otherwise and give yourself a huge social safety net as well. It was wonderful going to the furry fandom, but for a bunch of us, it's just, uh, basically for some Therians, they see furries as, I don't get it. If they have fun, great, but it's not for me. Gotcha. But yeah, not all Therians are furries. I happen to be some of the few that are, because I know plenty that are not. Interesting. Yeah, that's one misconception. Another one is that most Therians, you would never know the Therian unless they tell you. Or if they're wildly open about it, which is me. (laughs) I am extremely vocal about being Therian. I do not hide it at all. I've been vocal about it since I was in university back around age 19 and 20. All my friends back then, all my normie friends knew I was Therian and they were cool with it back in 07 and 08. Uh, but for most of us, we hide it because it's a, we, it would be another way to make fun of us and to put us down. Of like, oh, you think you're an animal? Oh, that's crazy. Why would you ever think you're anything other than that? You're, you're just a crazy wolf boy. And it is, it hurts. So, and you don't want anyone to know that you are like this. So you just clamp it down and you just put yourself buried in the closet and you don't want anyone else to know that is you. So you basically hide. And unless you're very vocal about it, most people never know that you're Therian. So you may not know who they are. And Therians, yes, some of us do howl, yip, bark. And whatnot, but we know there's a time and a place for most of us. We are masking to basically get through a day to day to be functional adults and functional members of society. So we hide all that stuff from the world because we don't want anyone to think that we're a bunch of crazies. So we know how to adapt and to be able to be functional members of society. No, I think that's a really great point. And, you know, I definitely think that there's a a lot of relating in terms of masking in our daily lives for a number of other different communities as well. So it really makes sense to me that that is kind of like a function of what you kind of have to do just to get through the the day and day, because so much of society is uh, centered around this norm that is so inaccessible for most. So, I I mean, it makes sense. Like being called a crazy wolf boy in school. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, geez. But yeah, I think that's, that's really good to kind of clear up. And I guess I'm interested in like, how your experience has been sharing that you are a Therian with others, both inside and outside the fandom. Has it been always like a very open and like welcoming sort of experience within the community? Or has there been any issues? Or have you had experience sharing it with folks outside the fandom who were like pretty chill with it? Someone once uh, started quoting Bible passages from Christianity at me. That was fun. Uh, Oh, yeah, and why animals don't have souls, and that was something else. But generally speaking, since since I was in university onwards, most people are totally cool with it. Like, even my coworkers are like, oh, okay, cool. And... Uh, but like in high, in middle school, I I had some people ridicule me about it and call me names. Yeah, it was not fun at all, and people thinking that you're crazy. And but most of the time, like I'd say ninety nine five percent of the time, most people are completely fine with it, which is a relief. I personally have a way to indicate, like I wear dog collars. I've been wearing dog collars since 2007. I wear a dog collar to represent myself being trapped in a human form. But when I'm in fursuit, I do not wear one because I am now free of it. 
And this is symbology that I've lived through my entire life. So going to the office at a white collar job where I'm wearing a black leather dog collar to work and yeah, to say, oh yeah, this is this representation of society. And it's like, <laughs> okay, cool. And I polished it up with everything else I wore. And I even hung my key to get into the building on it. That's bold. Uh-huh. <laughs> This is back in 2010. Yeah, that's super so, bold. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. And I'm still wearing one to this day. Amazing. And you, I think it's incredible that you've been able to kind of open up about it with your work colleagues and that they've been totally chill with it. Like, that, mm-hmm. is, that is wild to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I do that because I've become myself and it's like I don't want to hide this because my experience about this is that I see it personally as really great blackmail material. If you have someone hanging this over your head, it's a great way for them to control you because you do not want to let it slip that you believe you are something that's not human. So what I did was just say, well, I mean, if it's out in the open, then how is anyone going to use this blackmail material against me? It's already out there. Come at me. So that's why I'm so public about it because then no one can no one can accuse me of it because it's like well it's already known everyone else around me knows about this so got anything else? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. And you know, I, I will also say like particularly uh, like back in like the 2010s, for example, like that definitely would have been the kind of thing that people would hold over people's heads. I think people these days have gotten a lot better about that kind of stuff. Like I, I know, like look, I post photo manips that involve myself with my dick out so like that's all online okay that's that's all out in the in the internet anyone can go and find that and wow. I, I have never like I, I mean i had one very bad experience back in the 2010s i don't con- have concerns about that now and like again i'm very like I, I mean i don't talk about that stuff at work personally but if that ever was an issue i'd be like go ahead like i don't care so you know it, 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 I think okay. the, the online space has definitely moved a lot more in towards understanding those kinds of things these days, which I think is a net positive for everyone to be able to like, you know, live their selves and live their truth. So I have, have such a bad counter question to that, which is barbs or not? Oh, well, <laughs> great question. Great question. So I... I have done artwork of both. Um, I will say that personally, in terms of what I associate with my Sona, I actually lean towards the knots over the barbs. I know that technically that is more of a canine than a feline thing, but Lombaxes are fictional, so I can do whatever the fuck I want. So I will pick knots if I have to pick. So Kudos to you. <laughs> Kudos to you. I figure it out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. <laughs> Yes, yes, because that's one that you don't normally ever see. All right. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've I've done manips like that. Welcome out. to the yeah, internet. welcome to the internet. I got my dick out. Whatever. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, back I guess to the topic at hand. You know, um, I think all of this kind of is a really interesting segue into TF because obviously I know that you are a big TF fan and you've also been involved in the transformation fandom for quite some time. So. I'm curious to build a little more on everything you've said and ask you, you know, like, how do you find your Therian side relates to the concept of transformation? I know, like, part of it was through, like, the dreams that you had and, like, media like Animorphs, but I'm curious as to how else you find that it relates to TF in general. TF in general, it, the best way to describe TF in general is, like, be a girl and go to the mall. And in the mall, there is the clothing store. Like J.C. Penney's, Macy's, Forever Twenty One, Gap, uh, Old Navy, whatever. You go in there and you see all the outfits in there, and it's like, ooh, what am I going to wear today? And then you go to get to the changing room, hey, <laughs> and then you go and try on different outfits. Well, and then you pick out which one you want, you buy them, you go home. Well, I would say to someone who doesn't really know what it is, it's like. So imagine that, but instead of it being clothes, it's TF serums or any other triggers that you would use for TF. And you go into the changing room and you try the different ones on, see which ones you like, and then you buy the ones you like, and then you go home. 
And it's like, you know, you get to ask your honey who's sitting outside on the bench because they're bored of us. And like, hey, does this TF like butt look big? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you get to try on different outfits, basically. So TF in general for me is I get to try different outfits. The one TF, there's two TFs that I've been like, that are like, yeah, I guess you call them sacred. But like the ones that are super personal to me is my personal male to female in real life transformation, which I can tell you is a lot of pain and agony and not as fun as the pictures make it out I can only imagine. (laughs) Lots of agony. Trust me, if it went any faster, it would have killed me. Uh, And then, of course, turning into my proper thereoside. Those are ones where, like, I'm just turning back into my core, which is why a lot of my TFs involve me turning from wolf soon to something completely different. It's because that is my base form. Human is not my base form. Wolf soon is my base form, which is why a lot of the TFs I have commissioned for myself involve me starting from Wolf Kitsune to something gotcha. different. That's so interesting. Yes. Um, but, like, I love TF. I mean, it is amazing. Like, being able to, like, feeling all the changes, like the subtle changes as your skin starts growing fur, the nails pushing out, your muscle growing, oh, yeah. your ears lengthening and so forth. I mean, that's just It's hot. very hot. Come on. I mean, I mean, it, I'll, I'll, it is a deliciously wonderful medium and you can do so much with it there is a lot of stuff that is in like the g through r spaces and then there's the nc17 stuff which is very squicky to even me like there's a lot of stuff in tf where it's like no Mm -hmm. i i'm not even going to touch it i mean some tf is really fun but yes there is all this tf is like it's like a cookbook it's like this is the base. Go for it. Best way to describe it, it's like poutine. It is, you have the base, and you can add all the toppings you want. <laughs> I appreciate the Canadian analogy, so uh, that makes me happy. It's delicious. It, is. it really is. I have cheese curds in my fridge right now. I have a recipe to make gravy, so all I need is the french fries, and I got poutine Amazing. ready to go. Amazing. Oh, man, it's- I went to Montreal, I went to Quebec and had poutine okay. out there. And- Good. You had, you had the authentic, authentic experience then. <laughs> yes, I did. That's amazing. Shout out to Mary Fox for letting me come over. <laughs> <laughs> also TF fanatic. Nice. Like nice. So then I guess, you know, I think you've kind of described TF almost as a way not only to experience different forms, but also to kind of realize a Therian side to yourself. Um, and, you know, I've noticed that TF and the Therian community do seem to have a decent amount of overlap in terms of community membership. So I was interested to hear your thoughts on how exactly you distinguish between someone who enjoys different forms and someone who has like this core feeling of being at home in a specific other form. I mean, if you enjoy different forms, you enjoy different forms. I mean, yeah, you have cookies, but there's different types of cookies out there. They're delicious. But what we're saying is like, but the thing here is that TF into my core form is more of like a escape of like, I'm well, not really escape, but more of a self-actualization of I am going to turn into myself. I'm going to rip off this to show the real being that's underneath here uh, versus it's like, Put a different outfit of like so we're gonna put on, I don't know, a Balcar form, or we're gonna put on a lion form, a lombax form, a whale form, a were shark form, or even a car, because yes, that exists. And the, they are great. Um but like the thing is that those are like changing clothes, those are all fun. Versus Therian going to that form as your this is self actualization into the form that you know you are supposed to be inside of. I actually had a song commissioned by one of my friends named Foxamore, and he wrote a song called Resurgence for me, which is a complete transformation song about someone turning into the form that they know they're supposed to be. So, yeah, basically the difference is one is like 
Ooh, different clothes and outfits stuff. The other one is, this is self-actualization into the thing I actually am. I'm not going to be a monster anymore. I'm turning to the thing I know I'm supposed to be. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, I definitely think that a lot of people have felt that experience to some degree when it comes to TFing into their sonas in, in artwork. And so I guess that's a bit of a wrinkle because, uh -huh. you know, there are obviously some TF furries who feel like a deep kinship with their Sona, but they don't necessarily identify as a Therian. So I guess I'm curious as to yes. what you think the difference is between people who love TFing into their Sona versus T people who are into TF who are Therians, because I do think there's a lot of overlap there. And I wonder like what the exact difference is. I've talked to some people like that and they just see it as like an alpha of just, it's like, that is them. It's like their self-actualized version of themselves but they don't say, but they are also comfortable being in human form as well. But they, they self don't identify as Therian. There's this thing amongst Therians we call it Weirdar. And stuff like that, our Weirdar does perk up and go, okay, maybe down the line, give it a while. Sometimes it pans out to the Therian. Sometimes you go in self-discovery, find out they're not. And it's like, well, you know more about yourself than you ever did before. And kudos to that. Uh, which, hey, self-discovery is extremely important. Like, if you discover that, hey, I'm not actually transgender, it's like, you know what? Good, because that means you know more about yourself than anyone else would ever question, which is very important. So who, I'm not saying that someone who thinks that way is going to become there in the end. It just means this is something that they would like to look like, but they don't feel like they actually should have been born as Bark Bark, or it's like, like hey, they're a human. But it's like, you know what? I prefer to look like this. I'm okay with being human, but I, I want to oh, look shit. like this. Instead. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I think um, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. good way to kind of phrase it. Um, but yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I guess then, you know, kind of like wrapping things up a little bit on this segment, you know, obviously I think that there's been a lot of information that we've shared about Therians. And I guess I'm curious if you have any thoughts on like what someone should consider or do if they are curious about Therians and like maybe they feel like they might be one, but they don't really know what to do about it or how to express themselves or how to like investigate that feeling. I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on like any like options they can do for self-discovery or anything like that? Absolutely. I would say, first of all, imagine yourself as a creature, like research, do your homework on that creature, figure out like what they do, what they like, see if that's something that you definitely are like, hey, that's me. Write stories, do role plays, get artwork, something, try it out. If you think you might be, then reach out to any. Therian on Twitter or Mastodon or any other flavor of social media of the year and someone will be willing to lend you an ear or to send you to people that know chat groups and you can go into chat groups and then talk to others about it and bad ideas off and maybe you are maybe you're not but if you end up going hey I don't feel like I should have been a human I need to be this. This is me. Okay. And then just work through those feelings and say, okay, maybe you are actually a Therian. If you're not, that's fine too. If, if you find out that you aren't in the end, hey, you know more about yourself than you ever would have beforehand. And that's extremely important of knowing yourself more. Uh, but no, there's a lot of um, like... My door is always open, but there's a plenty of other Therians out there who would definitely be more than happy to help and that's chat. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think that's a really that's a really great piece of advice. And, you know, obviously, like you said, it's always good to know more about yourself. So I think that's a great uh, kind of thing for people to do, to do that kind of uh, self-reflection and, like, introspection and come to a better terms in terms of what they feel like. Um, uh-huh yeah uh-huh so then i guess um Bye -bye. to end on a lighter note i'm curious why mao instead of yip because <laughs> i've noticed okay, so. <laughs> okay yes i do go a lot versus yip and uh so what happened is that i was in college and one of my friends went bow, bow, bow. 
And I'm like, that's a cute noise. So I started mimicking it. It was spelled B-A-U. And one person was like, hey, look, it's evil blue. Took a two by four and smacked someone over the head with it. That was like, okay. Uh, But then years and years later, I got my very first fursuit one. What noises should I make in fursuit? Hey, I got a good one. And then it just stuck. And then I've realized I've created a language around it where it's like, hello, or goodbye, or yep, or uh-oh, or are you okay? Do you need a hug? Um, or it's like, yeah, it's basically like a total language where the tone of the mao determines what has been said. So it's basically turned to tone language, and it's just basically my catchphrase at this point. Of instead of going, Poof, I can go, meow, meow, Poof. I can howl. I don't know how well the micro will pick it up, but I, sometimes I can actually do a meow into an I really hope it did not blow the levels on that. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out. Yes, we will. The recording. <laughs> Sorry, audience. <laughs> oh, but that's awesome. It's cool that like it it started out as kind of an innocuous thing that has now kind of stuck, and it, it, it definitely makes you stand out, which is uh, always nice. So that's really cool. <laughs> Amazing. So, you know, I wanted to chat a little bit as well about the current long running webcomic that you've been creating uh, called Wolf's uh, Journey <laughs> um, in partnership with Urban uh-huh. Vixen. Um, and for those who aren't aware, it's about a human Therian and a wolf who can walk among humans and their story of becoming wolves and fitting into a pack. So I have a lot of questions, but I guess to start off, um, what inspired the webcomic in the first place and kind of got you down the path of even writing a webcomic? Oh, April 2018, Furry Week in Atlanta. It was about Sunday morning. I was in the shower, and I was thinking to myself about, like, about something. I was thinking about a wolf that had turned human and had discovered, like, furries and going, this is, I would even want to do this. But then I was like, fuck, why, why would we look at furries? What about Therian? You know what? Let's put him in a diner. As, what the hell would they talk about? A wolf that's turned human and a therian, wolf therian in the diner talking to each other. What would they talk about? I wonder how they think about the other one's lives and, and with the other situation. Boom! That's, that's when I got the idea for Wolf's Journey in my head. And then I started thinking about it through the con. As in Fulce was just thinking about this, start, the con was like, I wonder, and people were going, ooh, you should build on that. And then I started thinking about it. I started talking with with someone because I was originally going to make this into a novel. And I had actually figured out the ending. I was like, I know how it's going to end. Redacted because the ending's not out yet, and I'm not going to give spoilers. (laughs) Fair. Uh, But then I knew there were two characters, Vance and Aquila. Aquila was the wolf that could walk amongst people we have called the man walkers now which is effectively a reverse werewolf and then you have vance who is an orphan who is therian and eventually will turn into a wolf and i thought about this for years and then what happened was i met urban vixen later that year and she did a fantastic piece of art for me and what happened was someone said hey you like tf art you should go over see urban she's really well known over here i'm like Oh, no. Fuck. Someone that I don't know about? Okay. I'm commissioning you for something. Then I saw her again at Midwest Fur Fest 2018. And I said, hey, I have a really weird idea. Because at the time, I was thinking about just getting some picture. I wasn't thinking of Wolf Street at the time. The idea was, what about a Wolf to Human TF six pages? Ooh, okay. So we were going to do that. Then January rolls around. And then find out that she does comics. So I said, make a comic. So originally it was supposed to be a wolf to human TF comic about 11 pages long. 
And I went, if I do this, a lot of people are going to give me a lot of flack about this. So we're going to take this story, but we're going to actually end it like this. And then as it went along, it ended up 24 pages long and became Children of the Sun. A light bulb hit me and went, my story, I'm kicking in the back of my head with Vance Aquila, will reach a bigger audience if this is a webcomic. Urban! Got a question! And at the time, I was figuring this is going to be about maybe 100 pages, 200 tops. And I said, I have an idea for a webcomic. You can say no. It could be this long. It could be 100, 200 pages long. Do you want to embark on this? After we finished Shelter of the Sun, and she said yes. And then after we finished Shelter of the Sun, it was until June 2020 that we started workshopping the first pages of Wolf's Journey. Yeah, the first page went up January 2021. And it's just been pretty constant ever since. About a page a week, yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty incredible. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I think really permeates the comic is there's a sense of, like, the comic having Therian themes really deeply woven into it. And I don't just mean, obviously, the incorporation of the Therian character, but I mean, like, there's a struggle to find acceptance within a group for both the originally human character and the originally wolf character as, like, he's reintegrating back into his pack. And I'm really interested in hearing more about how you developed those themes and how you set up this really interesting contrast between the two characters undergoing a parallel journey of sorts. Uh-huh. So you have found it, and I'm very happy that you did find that. So Vance is the audience. I made him an orphan specifically so that way he would have no ties back to the human world, so no one would be really looking for him. I... Uh, he wears a dog collar for the same reason why I do, which is to represent being stuck in human form. And so when it shatters, that is to represent he is free of his human form. And some of the stuff that he's called, I've been called those names too. Uh, like Crazy Wolf Boy. Yeah, I was called then in middle school. Great. Um, I he is the eyes and eyes, so he is wish fulfillment, but then living with that wish. So post TF, uh, right there. Akila, on the other hand, is me more grown up. Vance is more like teenage me. Akila is more adult me, trying to live with this. But I took Therianthropy and flipped it around, so it's like okay, instead of looking at it as a like Therian, I don't know if the wolf is thinking about but going to the other direction. And then I can screw with the audience, but also make them realize how much of a pain it actually is to feel like you don't belong. And he he really goes through a lot, like just in the 100 plus pages that have been published, like he's really struggling. You can tell, um, particularly in the most recent pages, like he's really struggling with being back in the pack and like feeling that he doesn't fit. Correct. Yep, yeah, that is exactly what I want them to feel. Because both of them are effectively in the closet. So even though there's no LGBT characters per se, they are going through an LGBT experience of not being, uh, not being, they're not assigned species at birth. They are like, they one's transition, the other one doesn't know what to transition into. And they have to be in the closet because there's this plot in here of they... There is this lore that says if a man walker, man walkers exist, a man walker is a reverse werewolf, wolf that can become human and walk amongst humans. If they're found to keep the inspection from getting to any of the pack members, they are exiled permanently. The pack has no idea that they are not what they say they are. If they get found out, they risk getting banished from the pack. They do not want Especially this. for Vance, obviously, because this is like, you know, he's achieved something he's always wanted to be. Although I know he's not technically the man walker, but like he's undergone a transformation of his own. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep, he's technically not a man walker. That is true. But he is also not fully wolf either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's effectively a werewolf, though. He is, Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it's so interesting that you've come up with that lore because, you know, in particular, something I've noticed in the comic is that there is 
a lot of realistic depictions of wolf tactics and behaviors. And obviously, you know, protecting the pack from external threats is, is a very common thread in wolf behaviors. So I'm curious, did you already have like a lot of those ideas around the behaviors and tactics? Like, did you already have a lot of that knowledge on hand or did you have to conduct a lot of research in advance to planning out the comic? I studied wolves when I was a kid. I've been studying wolves for a very long time because I want to know more about myself. Uh, a lot of this I knew already. However, Urban Vixen, she's also done her own research too to make sure she gets the position of the wolves correct. So the actual minute mannerisms she's been studying through different wolf pictures. And I have been also sending her a crap ton of depictions of the surrounding area, the Pacific Northwest, where I currently reside. But she's done research, and I basically lived this. So in my mind, the best way to describe me is I am, I am a wolf that learned English. I mentally, my, me, my residual self-image is that of a wolf kitsune. I'm a four-legged bark bark that goes, burp, 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 burp. I just know that... I can't be perceived that way externally, so I have a lot of repression that goes on. And I know I have to act and be functional. So yeah, basically it's because this is how my brain already thinks. Yeah, it, I mean, it makes sense that you would already have a lot of that knowledge on hand. And it's really cool that you've yep. also incorporated like, you know, reference pictures and such. I know that like both you and Urban Fixin have mentioned in like the notes for the comic. I'm curious then, um, you know, how much, how much work you had to do to find like the exact right reference photo photos for certain things, because there's like a, in particular, there's a lot of expressiveness with the faces of the wolves to really like convey the, uh, the emotional state, uh, and the emotional state that they're trying to convey to, you know, other characters. And I'm just curious, like how difficult it was to find those reference pictures. Like, are there a lot wildly available? There's a lot of reference pictures out there. Urban could tell you so much about the reference pictures. There is a lot that she has found. She's found a treasure trove of different wolves, different angles. She, we ha she has sketches. She has scores of sketches of just how to make a wolf face look. How they walk properly. What, what positions for sitting, standing, walking, running, everything. Even tail flicks, it's all there. We Every single character also has its own color scheme as well. Every single one has its own color palette, their own ref sheet. It's all there. And also, I do scene directions as well, of like tail goes down, tail goes up, tail does a flick, ear flicks, or paw to nose. So it's all there. And it's just, there's, there's a lot of body language because that's how they mostly communicate is with body language, is extremely important. And humans do not really have body language. They have facial expressions, which I don't really have. And a lot of people misread me because of that. Because for me personally, going back to therianthropy, my brain is sending a signal to a tail that no one can see. So I, yeah, so tail movement is important to me. It is inside of comic. It's basically like Wolf's Journey is like watching a movie in a theater and trying to write down really fast what you're watching and then go leaving the theater, no, or just pausing it and then telling someone who's who cannot see the screen what you just watched and then they draw it. Gotcha. <laughs> that's that's that a really great analogy. That is how Wolf's Journey is made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's about the best way to describe it. It is a movie that lives rent-free in my head. Amazing. And, you know, I think it's so cool that this is a project that you're making in collaboration with uh, Urban Vixen, like, you know, an artist who's doing the artistic side. So, you know, you talked a little bit about scene direction, but how does the process usually work in terms of creating a collaborative comic with someone else? Like, how, what goes into, like, the creation of a page, for example? Oh my God. So first of all, I wrote the entire script. The script is already done. I know how it ends. Every scene is laid out. I may have to add more scenes in, but they are there. Uh, what happens is 
we call once or twice a week. We have to coordinate because we are eight hours apart. So we have the block out time. She has to block out time on her schedule. I block out time on my schedule. And then we have, we call, we say hi. I use a program to remote desktop into her system so I can watch her draw. And we have a, don't laugh, I use Excel to organize everything. I use Excel for the cost of the comic, how many pages in we are so far, character bios. So I actually have character references in Excel of their name, their gender, their apparent age, uh, their physical features, their backstory. I also have ones that tell me the different arcs I have to make sure I hit properly. Then I also have a script that shows the entire thing, the scene name, the page number, and the different names, and what's going on, and what they're saying. It's all in there. So what we do is we get on the phone call, we talk about like how's your day going, catch up, and then I watch her screen, and some days it's just her drawing a scene in, or what we do is if we have we have two columns in our script page. One column is the finished, we have sketched it, and there's another one that is pending storyboarding. So we go to pending storyboarding and we start laying out these different rectangles on the screen, and each rectangle represents one full comic page. And we look at the text and the dialogue, and we go through every single panel in painstaking detail of which way should they be looking? Where is the camera? Where is the light coming in? Where is every little nook and cranny going on per frame of the page? And, oh, we need another page. Okay, another page. Oh, we don't need that page. Gone. And we need to change the dialogue. Oh, this is janky. We need to fix this. Okay, we reword the dialogue. Okay. Or sometimes take entire scenes and move them around in the thing and then try to rewire them so they fit. And we sketch all these pages out and finalize them so we know how many pages we're at. And we have the page number on the Excel sheet matches the page number for the actual file name itself. And then we go through everything. And then we also go through the stuff that's in progress and say, okay, is this right, this wrong? Oh, this person's missing a markings. I've caught some funny stuff where it's like, the bracelet on the original pages would just suddenly switch hands. And I'd catch that and be like, hey, that's missing. Or the dog tag's missing. Or like, hey, there's a dot of white in the middle of the page. Where did that come from? But like, we catch all of them before. I proofread everything before it goes out and finalize it. It's honestly a lot of fun to do. It's a lot of fun. I look forward to our meetings. And we even have meeting minutes because we are oh that organized. <laughs> so we actually have meeting minutes of what we need to tackle today and what's going to happen next. And next week's is going to be fun because uh, redact. I see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be But by the time this podcast comes out, maybe it'll be displayed. I don't know what the turnaround time is of these things. But I do know that at one point in the future, the scene I'm talking about, you're going to see, and I believe your audience might enjoy it. I'm very excited to to see what this ends up being. But that's really cool uh, that the collaborative process works in that way. I got to confess that I have little experience in terms of that kind of collaborative work, but it sounds like so fascinating that you have these meetings and, you know, you're cross collaborating across an eight hour time difference. Yeah, like, I, I will give you a hint, an example of this. So we have a hunt sequence where Van, where the pack yes. hunts an elk. I think and it's Vance's it first time hunting too, right? We spent... Yeah. Correct, yes. We drew out the entire landscape and where everyone was and the direction of the flow of the action... Before we could actually start storyboarding the individual pages. Just so we knew what each angle was so we'd have continuity through the entire scene. I, I, I gotta put my hats off to that because it's like mad respect on maintaining the continuity. There are 
people with bigger budgets who it's... do less work on that. So I, it's appreciated. <laughs> uh huh. Like there's actually a scene in the earlier pages where Van, where Keel is doing his transformation. Well, it's the second transformation in the story because the first one is implied of of him turning to a, a human. But when his eyes turn gold, this is not spoiler. This has been out for like almost two years by the time of this recording. Uh, and he is looking straight at Vance. A few pages later, you see Vance panting and Akila looking. The camera flips 180 degrees in that scene, where we start the scene with Vance looking at Akila, and we end it with Akila looking at Vance, both in wolf forms. So basically, the camera, the angle has changed from a human-centric perspective to a wolf-centric perspective. Yeah, there's still things like that. I've left breadcrumbs through the entire story. There is everything there. There's actually a few Easter eggs. Now I'm now I'm gonna have to go back and see if I can find any of those. I will give you a hint of one of them. Page fifty-two. Look in the bush. Um, also, I have done a cameo in it uh, on page ninety-four. There, I do have a cameo. Very weird getting myself of only one tail, because <laughs> I have nine. But yes, um, uh, yeah, there's a few cameos in here. Urban Vixen herself, page 76, has her own cameo in it, and there's more to come. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very good TF comic. It's, I'm curious it's, then, um, yeah. in terms of like the actual collaboration process, um, have there ever been any sort of creative struggles at points as how to... at I'm going to say this question again. Have there ever been any creative struggles at points as to how to best depict the themes? Yes. We think uh, sometimes it's like some scenes where it's like trying to get the angle just right on the camera is a little tricky. Or it's like, do we need this scene? No. Bye. And like sometimes it's like a case of like, oh, we actually need a scene to bridge this and this together because this scene's actually important because this is pushing the plot forward. So one thing that we've learned is, does a scene need to exist? Is it pushing the plot forward? The answer is no, the scene goes away. So all the scenes are pushing the plot forward. There's no, there's some filler scenes, but like they're coming up, but they're basically there for comedic relief. Take with that as you will. If you know what that means, you know what's about to happen. Uh, but yeah, so there is there's a lot of drama that has not yet happened here. But I've hinted at it. There's a lot of drama. And I do not pull punches. So have there been any interesting things that have sprung up from this collaboration that you didn't plan for from the outset? I know you've already talked about like, you know, certain scenes that came in and stuff like that, but anything that like really changed the trajectory of the comic or has it mostly like followed that set story path that you came up with like in your head originally? I was not expecting the amount of violence. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, this is not a, this is... Not a all sunshine and rainbows comic. There, there is going to be violence. We've already seen an elk get killed in here, and there is a lot coming down the pipe. The thing that really worried me was I knew the beginning and the ending originally, and then I took a vacation to a lake in Wisconsin, and then wrote like everything from page eighty forward was written in a single week. I've done some infills since then. But, like, there are some developments of, like, oh, do something with a character. And it's like, okay, make their backstory rich and flush. And then find out, like, oh, someone is just a two, is just a printed cardboard paper. I need to fix this and then give them more, yeah. more thoughts and feelings. To like, every character in this story has their own life. You could role play as these characters. They have that much backstory on them. They are a bonafide person so that is the that is important to make a story work and also what's really important when you're writing a story is know how it's going to end so i wrote this story with the ending already in mind 
that was extremely important. I knew how this thing ended back in 2018. And basically, I wrote the story, and there's five separate story arcs going on in this story. There's not one, there's several. And I did that to keep it entertaining. Because otherwise, it'd be pretty much a standard flaw. You could have made the story a hell of a lot shorter. But, like... Or I could have just, like, said, Oh, this is all dream, like saying elsewhere. And that would... Okay, that's a very old reference. I should not have used that <laughs> Well, one. I got it. Basically, so. <laughs> yay! Okay, yeah, that's a cop-out. For anyone who doesn't know, St. Elsewhere was a hospital procedural drama show. And the cop-out was, spoilers, the entire... At the, in the last scene of the last episode of the series, you find out the entire show took place... And an autistic kid's head. It's kind of a cop out. Just, just a little. Yeah, bit. that is a cop out. <laughs> so I am not doing that with this story. Okay, that's good. To oh know. hell no! <laughs> I almost did just to screw with the audience, but then I decided not to. Do it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you chose not to. But uh, that's, that's really funny. You know, I then I'll, I'll gotta ask. You know, like obviously, TF is only featured towards the beginning of the comic. From what we've seen, folks, so far, I I, I hear you laughing. I'll, I'll 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 just I'm putting that out there in terms of what the audience has seen. Um, but it's also very pivotal to the story. So I was curious yes. to know, like, you know, how does its inclusion tie back to the importance of transformation in your own life? Like, did you set out on writing a TF story for the th- from the start, or was it always just going to be a theme that was incorporated later on? It, it was always going to be in the start. I always knew I had to have at least two TFs in the story to begin with, which was Vance and Akila. Mm-hmm. I will, since this is a podcast, I'm going to let you in a little tidbit of information. The majority of the TF sequences in the story have not been done. Oh, you tease us. <laughs> <laughs> there is at least six or seven more transformation sequences in the story. Wow. Okay, that is good to know. I, yeah. I, that's music so, to my ears, so. <laughs> there's a lot of TF. Don't worry, it's music to Urban Vixen's ears because she's actually a TF artist. She is. She is. And a very good one at that, so. <laughs> very, very good one, yes. But yes, there's a lot more TF coming down the pipe. So originally the TF was to get the story started. Of course. You could see it is a post TF sequence of the world and you're not the first person to tell me that i've had other people tell me that this is exploring a lot of the post tfat sequence themes and from what's been seen so far they are not wrong something that i saw that really was like oh this is really cool was this story by a guy called valsalia named out of placers that also deals with post tf and living through it i'm not sure if you're familiar with the story I have not read it, unfortunately Okay, so it involves this, uh, I would say, like, a, uh, a town basically somewhere during the time of the Roman Empire, maybe later. But basically, it's a world where there's different sentient animals. There's humans, there's, there's uh, these, Iraq, these uh, bugs that are sentient, there's rock monsters that are sentient, and then there's these little rat birds that are sentient called yinglets. And they and the thing and one of the main characters gets turned into this rat bird like creature and now has to live through the consequences of this in a world that was not built for these creatures. And living between two worlds of no longer fits in human, now has to live with a new reality, and oh my goodness, how the hell do I survive this? And I thought it was a really cool comic. And it's still ongoing at two high, almost 300 pages and counting. So, so basically what you're saying is you're eventually going to try and surpass that. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe in the sequel. <laughs> yes, you heard it here. I am working on a sequel as well. Amazing, amazing. Um, but yeah, you know, I was going to ask, like, you know, obviously it, it's a story that's a lot deeper than this, but you could argue that it does function as an in-depth exploration of post TF. Like there is a lot of acclimatization going on for both characters in terms of their situation. So you've kind of already said that is kind of a fair analogy. So I guess what thoughts do you have on that take and also thoughts on post TF content in general? I don't see a lot of post TF comic content because 
TF is a very expensive medium because you can get a one page TF sequence, which is like mid TF. But like I find my butter zone is at least six pages of TF per sequence. And usually it's just, you see the before, during and after, but seeing the post TF sequence usually doesn't happen because usually it's not the part that I personally reread. However, when I wrote this, it wasn't designed to be a TF based comic. TF is just the catalyst to go from point to point B to get the story going through. So it's not so it's not like a general TF comic where that is the main theme. It's just it happens to get us to where we need to go. And there will be a lot more TF to come in this story. There's a, most of the TF has not actually occurred yet in the story. There's still a lot more to go, but they're just they're being used in this story as a vehicle to get us to the scenes that we need to get into. So I guess a good way to summarize it is like, it wasn't your intent for it to be like a post-TF narrative, but the people who are reading it Correct. in that way, there is some validity to that, even if it's not really the theme. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I can see it fitting perfectly, actually. It wasn't my goal originally, but you know what? Hey, it works. And it makes me happy. To see that people are enjoying it, people are. I just just the fact that people are enjoying this brings bring, makes my tail wag. Well, makes all my tails wag. Uh, and I'm just very grateful that people are able to relate to this and go. I can see myself in it. I've hit people in the feels really hard with this story, and I'm very. It means I've gotten. I've done my job on this story and I'm very proud of it and how far it's come. And there's other stories I want to bring to light, but right now all my resources are being directed into Wolf's journey and I need to get this story out. And we have contingencies because there's this one story called Off-White that was years ago that ended in a cliffhanger and the artists were like, we're done. And there was no resolution. I am not doing that. If something happens where we cannot continue, the contingency is either find a way to get the art done or I will post the entire remaining part of the script online and say, this is how it's supposed to well, end. I appreciate that because it, it's one of the biggest disappointments when a webcomic ends on a cliffhanger and you never get the resolution. So I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I have the contingency in place. In fact, both of us got hit really hard with heart issues in October. And we have we are healing. We are doing a hell of a lot better now. And yeah, that's why the comic went a hiatus for a month last year. Because we both had serious health issues that needed our attention. We both got hit less than 24 hours apart. We have heart, we have a uh, health well, issue. I'm glad you're on the men now and uh, hopefully like you'll continue to make a solid recovery and um, you know, obviously all the best on that front. So yes, we are going, we are goals to get back to doing two pages a week. Awesome. So I have some audience questions uh, to go Woo! through that I think will be fun. Um, so the first question comes from Kay Libra, uh, uh, co-host on the pod um, and he asks um, if you got all the chaos emeralds what would your super form be like and would you have a specific color and what powers would that amplify so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that elaborate <laughs> oh from the sonic franchise oh oh okay chaos Emer my final four would be like full blown kitsune form ready to mold the world as if i was neo i would just make everything happen and the chaos i would unleash on the world is tf <laughs> for everyone i mean i support this <laughs> you get a tf you get a tf you get a tf everyone that knows. wants a tf <laughs> yeah. y'all yes everyone gets a tf now and you get to tf into whatever you want for as long as you want. There's no two hour time limit. It's as long as you want. Amazing. Um, I think if I got all the Chaos Emeralds, I think first of all, my super form would probably be based off of Shadow because I love Shadow. He's my my uh, one true love. Um, so I guess I'd probably go with like a combination of like 
red and black for a color. And I guess like my, my, my cop out would be the same power that you mentioned. If I was going to give a different one, um, I would ideally like some sort of like reality shifting power, like outside of TF to change things in, in various ways. So that would be, uh, my like non TF answer, but like we all want some TF in there. So, you know, <laughs> we all need a little TF in our lives, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then we have a question um, from Bolus, and Bolus asks, what is an unpopular thing to TF into that you feel deserves more love? Reverse TF is something you don't see every day, but that can be a Horde writer's masterpiece. There is some really fucked up TF out there that involves reverse TF. There's this one I read in college that was a wolf that that was basically a reverse werewolf. And he tried to fit in and he couldn't fit back into his pack. And he went to a world where they had to blend in with the humans. And it fucked me up for, day, for weeks. <laughs> and... I am not kidding. It's a, it was it was like scary shit. That's a reverse TF is a great horror narrative. Um, TFs that we don't see a lot of are ones of exotic creatures. So like Zergles don't really have a lot. Lombaxes don't really have a lot. Progens are getting there, but there's not many of them. Rexoriums I don't really see any of. Um, but like. Those are very interesting TFs that we don't see a lot of. Or like, I don't remember if I've ever seen a penguin TF. Or like, having animal-to-animal -animal TF is also a really rare one to see that should get more love. Because you see a lot of human-to-animal TFs. Don't get me wrong. Those are everywhere. But animal-to-animal -animal TFs are not very well seen. You don't see a lot of those. And those definitely need a lot more love i agree and i will say as someone who owns probably like 60 to 80 percent of the stock of long max tfs i obviously would like to see more of those so i appreciate you mentioning that um i guess you know i i would joke and say pool toy but pool toy tf is everywhere um i think if i had I've, to i have a friend that does that stuff <laughs> yeah it's 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 really caught on um i think if i had to pick one that's like an unpopular thing to tf into that i think deserve more love um insects like i i actually really like insect tf and you do not see a lot of that um some of like the uh artist who's still around uh fox um she did a lot of like cockroach and like bee and uh ant and wasp tf back in the day and like some of those were like some of the first which TF fox art things uh the uh, fox with two x's Oh, okay, I just want to double check. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. She she did has done and continues to do some amazing insect TF, and I would love to see more of that. Obviously, they don't get a lot of love because a lot of people aren't huge fans of insects in real life. I will admit, I am a bit of a scaredy cat when it comes to insects in real life, but I love their anatomy and I really love how they look. Um, and like that is a kind of TF that I really love, and I wish there was more of. So. Lobster TF, that's a yes. rare one. Oh, Lobster TF is great. I have gotten that one. That one is great. I, I do love really? Lobster TF. Yes, I have. I'll have All to, right, I'll have to just stay away, from the, stay away from the boiling pot of water. Yes. Um, I was just saying, Moth Monarch does a lot of good bug TF as well. That's true. Yes, yes, they do. Moth Monarch, Monarch's bug TFs are, are sublime. So that's another great example. Um, yes, yeah. yes. And then uh, we have a question from Patrick Coyote and... Uh, Patrick asks, if transforming temporarily was something you could do recreationally, do you think you'd ever get tired of it and why? So nothing permanent, only temporary TFing. Does this... I'm assuming I'm in Wolf Sune form when I get this power. Okay, yeah, I think that's fair. Why do I get tired of that shit? It's like going to the grocery. It's like going to the store, going, "Ooh, let's try this on," or "Ooh, let's try this on," or "Ooh, let's try this on." It's how do you get bored? The possibilities are endless, and they're all temporary. You all, you know, you're going to come back to your base form as long as you get to go to your base form. It's all good. Is it, it, it means like, hey, I want to go flying today. Turn a bird. Yay! 
hey. Or it's like, you know what? I want to be a dragon today so I can go uh, do some nasty shit with my uh, boyfriend. Okay. Hey. Uh, like, basically, or like, ooh, I'm going to be talking to a Lombax today. Poof, let's turn to a Lombax today. Hey, and talk to that. Or like, oh, I'm going to go see some otters. Hey, let's go swim with the otters. Poof. Like, how do you get bored when you can turn... The only thing that's limiting yourself is your imagination. Oh, yeah. I completely agree. Like, the only thing I could think of it getting boring of is if you have the TF to do a job every single day. And it's the same thing day in and day out. That would get boring fast if the same repetitive TF. I agree. I frankly think that I wouldn't get bored of it either because I do also love the limitless possibilities. But I do agree that is definitely a potential limitation if, like, you know, you have to maintain your normal boring Cuban job and that's a TF you have to undergo over every day. Like, I would definitely get tired of that one and I'd be like, when do I get to clock out so I can become a whale or something? Like, you know, like, <laughs> that that is definitely at its core, you know? It remind me of a TF sequence I actually saw recently of this guy called Lance, Lance Fox, Going into his job uh, every every other weekend, he got he, he uh, he's a were shark in this picture. So he goes to the aquarium to clock in, and then he tf's into a shark of like, hey, this is a good gig, and then he jumps in, tf's into a feral shark, and the next day you just see him swimming around the tank in front of visitors as the as the tour guy is talking about the type of shark he is. He goes, this gig is awesome. <laughs> I love that. That would be a great gig to have, honestly. Yes. It's like free food, free accommodations. Like, come on. All I need to go swim, swim, swim. And that's it. Yeah. It's, it's pretty that's nice. amazing. Right? Right? Yeah. I, I very like, much support that. That's fun. That's fun. Shit. I mean, hell, as it is, I do not hide the fact that I'm, I'm Therian or furry at work. The background of my computer is me walking on the water, uh, walking on a beach at, at sunrise. My phone background is also is also me walking with TF in the background because human prints the wolf prints. Uh, I, I do not hide this at all. I mean, hell, recently I've been wearing a mask at work so I can actually do my job better. So you don't have to feel like I am stuck as a human because if anything, the one TF I absolutely need in my life is a transition into a wolf. Yeah. If I could have that, I'd be a thousand times happier than I am now because at least I would have one problem to worry about. It, it's crippling, but yeah. yeah. And I think it's incredible that um, you know you get to kind of like leave those uh, nuggets out in the open. You know, I will say my little like one subtle furry thing at work because I don't talk about this really with my coworkers or anything, but the d thing I do like to do um, is I have a series of um, animal pictures, like National Geographic photos of animals that I will cycle through as my background for calls. Um, and what they don't know is oftentimes the tail that I am wearing that they cannot see matches up with the animal behind me. So I, it's a nice little like, theme i think uh to That's incorporate in so cute as hell <laughs> i don't hide the fact that i'm a wolf my coworker knows i'm a kitsune but then again my coworker is also furry so that helps that makes sense <laughs> um yeah uh i given up my give shit a meter has gone down to pretty low point where it's like I would I I wouldn't mind showing up to work in a full suit. Oh wait, I've already done that shit. Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they wanted me to do a concert, so I did in full suit. Amazing, as I could. That's that's yes. incredible. Honestly, I don't. I also play music too. What do I not do? Is usually the best answer to give about what I normally do. Like, I wrote a cloud program that takes all my files from my laptop, my desktop, whatever, and backs them to a central repository and then sends it out to another machine once a week. And I wrote the entire thing myself. It is like 20,000 lines of code I wrote to make this thing work. And I wrote myself. It works anywhere in the world, and there's a program attached to it where if it ever gets the go signal, we'll wipe whatever device it's currently uh, running on. Wipe it. Gone deleted it's just dead 
and I wrote that program from scratch myself. I rewired my entire house. My, all my electrical wires are labeled every, every meter, but in the junction boxes is a emoticon cat face of equals carrot dot carrot equals under every single one of them. In the paneling of my car is a colon three buried underneath the radio stack. It, it is all in Sharpie, so it's not coming out. So yeah, I have little nuggets everywhere. Like I am, I organize hikes for Therians out here. Like I actually, I actually am the owner of a chat room for the Pacific Northwest Therians in this region. And every other week we go hiking because there's like 50 of us in this region. And I actually hosted parties at my house of Therianthropic centric parties. We've done potlucks, we've done pizza parties, we've howled, we've talked about Therianthropy, all this fun stuff. And it brings people together. And some of us are into TF and we talk about TF and it's a lot of fun. And I will give you another nugget of Wolf's Journey. Wolf's Journey is based in New Hampshire and Northern New England of the United States in the year 2011. Okay, good to know. And yep. I will just say that, you know, it's really cool that you've gone to build that uh, community around, you know, variants in the Pacific Northwest. And frankly, it sounds like it, it definitely makes things, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of not being a kitsune, it definitely brings joy. And I think that's really important. Yes, it does. It brings, if I can make other people happy, if I can make one person smile, I've done my job today. That is basically, that's, I'm very personable. I do not bite unless that's what you like. I can't, <laughs> I can't guarantee a TF will happen if I bite you, but we can try if you like. <laughs> Amazing. So that's all the questions that I had. I don't know if you had any questions back for me before we close things out. So now hearing me talk about therianthropy. Do you feel like you know more than you did beforehand, or is there like, like uh, things, any misconceptions you had that have now been cleared, or you're just like, I had no idea. Oh my goodness, did it, did it, um, did it make you think about yourself? Like you're gonna do a ret introspection after this? Yeah, you know, I think. Um... Like, I definitely knew some things about Therian, but I didn't know a lot. And I think that this discussion was really illuminating for me. I hope it was illuminating for all of our listeners. And, you know, um, I don't know if your weird art was going off, but I mean, I definitely am going to think on this because I think everything deserves consideration. And again, like you said, it's always good to do that kind of self-discovery and kind of get a sense as to yourself and just understand yourself better and do that self-reflection i i always value self-reflection so it it's super important it's super important i'm glad that i was able to shed some light on the topic Sh sorry i wasn't shedding fur it's still winter time up here it's currently five outside in celsius <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> It, so wait till spring and then when you blow your coat out for summer, then you can go make another dog out of it. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> if you got a husky, it's a lot of fur that blows out. Make some pillows out of that or make another husky out of it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, I mean, maybe there's going to be pups and wolf sturdy. Who knows? Time will tell. Mm. But there will be more transformations to come. Amazing. You didn't think there'd be that many TFs. I didn't. It. I thought that was it. So. Oh, no. Oh, no. We There's like at least five or more TFs left in the comic. Minimum. There might be more. I have to actually do a recount on it because I might be adding more scenes into it. And uh, yeah, there's a lot. Some people picked up on some stuff. I was at a con. A bunch of people told me they read the comic were amazed. One person started actually quoting from the comic and I was just like, holy shit. What? What just happened? Um... But, 
yeah, it's it's kind of an eye opening experience. It's just like when people start buying my music album, and I was like, they're listening to it, going, "Oh my god, I listen to this all the time," or like one person tells me that they listen to my album while building ships for the United States Navy, and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. My music's being played in a, in a location that I am legally not allowed to enter without going to jail. That is amazing. <laughs> oh, so then I guess uh, my final question is, did the Weardar detect anything? You are questioning yourself, aren't you? Perhaps, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I am going to go back and do that self-reflection. I think that's always important. I'm assuming that you're not human. <laughs> Perhaps not. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. You're gonna have to think about that. Okay. No, it, no, don't trust me. When I turned it, when I started thinking about it, uh, it, it was starting to peak. So yeah, maybe, maybe Weirdar is a thing. We before Therianthropy was a word. It used they used to call themselves wares. Ah, gotcha. So basically, so it'd be like your, your ware side, or like if there's a group of wares in the house, they call it the warehouse because puns. Some people actually still call it warehouses because, yeah. Uh, but then they switched it because it's too wolf centric. So then they went to Therianthropy instead. So now it's Theriocide instead of Wareside. But like the older generation will call, might still call it Wareside and Weardar. But yeah, I mean, this was back in alt horror werewolf days, which is a long time ago. Uh, but. I know many people that are on those forums way back when. I've I've only been in that community since like oh four, oh five. But like I've been there for a long time. I was I, I was in the Theron community almost a decade before I went into the furry community. And I joined the Theron community like the day I turned eighteen was I first went to IRC. Internet relay chat, think telegram but more manual. <laughs> oh, I, there are some... Or Discord for no yeah. manual and no audio and video. <laughs> there are some IRC users and uh, lovers who do listen to this podcast, so I'm sure they'll appreciate the show. Oh out. my goodness, IRC is still alive and kicking. Yeah. Okay, my desktop in the other room that I just built a couple years ago has, I, has Pigeon installed Amazing. on it. This has Colicly on it for my laptop. And my phone has Lime Chat, which is an IRC client for my cell phone. I appreciate your dedication. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I do a lot of stuff. So yeah, you. But yeah, so maybe let's see. Hypothetical: If you woke up tomorrow and poof, you are a Lombax, what would you do? Oh my gosh! I mean. Um... I would bemoan the fact that I didn't get to experience the TF personally. But after that, <laughs> after I make peace with that, I mean, I'd be over the moon. I'd be pretty fucking thrilled. So I don't know. I'd probably like <laughs> take pictures and like be really excited about it and like send all my friends all of the pictures and be like, so this just happened, you know? Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be pretty thrilled, honestly. So, so this just happened. I am now, I'm now a Lombax. Yeah. I don't know how this happened. I missed the damn TF sequence. Yeah. Son of a bitch. I just, I have to say that Unless as a Unless that TF was a dream you had. True. If it was a dream, I would accept that. If it was a dream and then I woke up and then I was TF'd, I would, I would be okay with that. But if I got to miss the whole thing, I'd be like, God damn it. So... <laughs> Yeah, right. It's kind of, I mean, yeah, if I woke up, I'd be like, ah, damn, I missed a TF. But at the same time, I'd be like, okay, I'm happy oh, now. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I would be happy that I got to TF anyways. So, like, I'm not, beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> I wish TF was a thing, but I also wish TF wasn't so painful in real life. Because I, I'm transgender. I transitioned male to female back in 2016. And I can tell you... It is not, it is physically painful to TF. Holy crap. I was, I had painkillers some days because the pain was agony. I want to scream from the pain. It was that bad. And it's just like, make it stop. And I love TF. And I was saying that. And it's like, but you're happy with the result. Yes. I can tell you right now, it's like, gotta watch out for that second puberty. 
It hits you every time. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, you're and, welcome. Um, if people are curious to see more of your stuff, where can they find you online? I am on Twitter, Aaron underscore Kitsune. I'm on Macedon, Aaron underscore Kitsune. I'm on Telegram, Aaron underscore Kitsune. I'm on Furfinity, Esteban. I also own a website called Esteban.com, where I am currently hosting Wolf's Journey onto. I also have AaronKitsune.bandcamp.com for my music album. And uh, yeah, I'm all over the shop. I uh, Urban Vixen, she is actually posting Wolf's Journey on her FA. That gets updated before anything else does. So if you want to see it before anyone else, go to her FA account, well, uh, Urban Vixen. And uh, yeah, I try posting them on Wednesdays for that comic. And usually, if you message me, I usually try to respond to those messages. I do read everything, no matter what. If I don't respond, I still read it all. Uh, but yeah, I am all over the shop. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much for making the time to come on. And thank you so much to everyone uh, for listening to the podcast this week. Again, if you're interested in supporting us, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Pod. And in the meantime, I hope you all have a great week. Um, I hope that you stay hydrated and that you keep an open mind and stay TFE. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you.